to you and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. This summer, I've been using one word more than any other word other than Jesus, I suppose, and that would be community. I had that whole sermon series based on Pastor Davy's book, Connected to Christ, finding, Overcoming Isolation and Community, and finding out that God has created us for community, the community of the church, the community of faith, the community of our families, since we're so isolated over the last year or so. And last week I talked about this new way of living in community, not only in the church, but also in our neighborhood communities, our village and city communities. And that would be to be tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's the new way of living. And last week I left you with that concept of, well, how can we live this new way? Well, today is the answer. And it is your heart work for today. It is in the rhetorical question that Peter asks of Jesus. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now, when you go somewhere, oftentimes somebody will ask you, how did you get there? Or how will you get there? There was a time when we would plan out our longer trips using maps and atlases. You could go to the store and buy the atlas of the United States and make different pages for the different states and you could plan out and it would give you tables on how far it is to go, how many miles you would have to travel to get to certain places. And even in the service stations, when you would stop to get gas, you can pick up maps or you can get a map when you cross over a state line in the, in the Welcome Center. They would have different maps for the different trips that you were taking. And you could unfold those maps and find the route that you could take. And then you would never be able to fold them back up again as, they, as you got them. Today, of course, we use our phones and the screen in our newer cars. So they still have maps on them, but now all we have to do is put in the address of where we want to go, and it tells us how to get there. In fact, it will give us different options on how to get there. We can avoid tollways, we can avoid highways altogether, we can avoid ferries if we're crossing rivers or lakes or oceans. That's how we would get to where we wanted to go. We would find the route to take on a map. Well, Jesus asked that very question of those who were gathered around him in the synagogue in Capernaum. And that's the question that prompted Peter's rhetorical question and answer, where Jesus says, do you want to go away as well? Now, this is all in John chapter 6, and John chapter 6 is packed full of deep theological doctrine and truth. I've sometimes heard it said for new Christians, oh, you should read the Gospel of John, because, of course, it has John 3.16 right in there at the beginning. But I would caution especially new Christians from reading the Gospel of John, the first thing that they read, because it is so full of these deep theological doctrines and truths of Jesus that if you're a new Christian, you may not have the background and the foundation to understand them. And that's what happens in John chapter 6. Jesus starts off with a story that if you grew up in the church, you all know, the feeding of the 5,000. And then Jesus sends his disciples off from where they were out in a boat to cross the lake to Capernaum, to the other side. And Jesus sticks around and then dismisses the crowds and then goes up on a mountain to pray by himself. Why? Because... He had just heard the news that his cousin John the Baptist had been executed, and he needed time alone with his Heavenly Father in prayer. As his prayers came to an end late that night, he sets out for Capernaum, and he starts walking, taking the, the shortest route there, walking straight across the lake on the water. And as he comes up to the boat, they see him, the disciples in the boat see Jesus, and they think it's a ghost, and he calms them down, do not fear, it is I, he gets in the boat, and immediately they're on the other side. 
And so they get out of the boat, and the crowds find them. And so Jesus, once again, starts teaching these huge crowds. And he ends up in the synagogue at Capernaum, and he starts to talk about the bread of life. And that's what we have been hearing over the last couple weeks in the gospel reading here in church. How Jesus is the bread of life. And if you eat that bread, you will live forever. In fact, he even summarizes that here. But he goes a little bit further. And as he discusses being the bread of life, his hearers are disgusted. For you must eat my flesh, and you must drink my blood, and you will have life within you. And his... The people hearing him are kind of taken aback. They're shocked. We've got to be zombies. We've got to be vampires. And they start to turn away from Jesus. The disciples, that extended group of followers and learners, the disciples, the 70 or, or more people that were following Jesus, start to pull back and walk away from Jesus. And so Jesus turns to his inner core of, tis, of disciples. His brothers, those 12 that he was so intimate and close to, and he turns to them as the others are walking away. Do you want to go away also? And Simon Peter answers for all of them, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And then he adds, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And here is the new way of living that I hinted at last week. Last week, from Ephesians, we talked about being tenderhearted and forgiving others as God in Christ has forgiven us. Here Peter puts it to these words. We believe and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is our new reality. Faith, belief, and knowing. Now, to believe that Jesus is the His, He is the one promised, starting in Genesis 3.15, as the Savior who would come to save us all from sin, from death, and from the power of the devil by His death on the cross. That's Jesus. And Peter says, we believe that. We believe that you are the Holy One of God. You are sent by God. He could even add, to be the bread of life as Jesus put it to words earlier in this chapter. That belief comes from faith, and faith is a gift of God that God gives to us through the power of the Holy Spirit working through the means of grace. That is God's word attached to water in holy baptism. That creates faith in us. And God's holy word attached to bread and wine that then it sacramentally changes into the body and blood of Jesus that we eat and drink. And that should sound familiar. That's what John 6 is talking about. But Jesus has not explained and instituted the altar just yet. That won't come until the night that he is betrayed, the night before he dies on the cross. And so they were not quite ready to understand fully what Jesus is talking about. And some of them choose to turn away. You and I, if you are a lifelong Lutheran, went through confirmation, you know all this. And so it's not a big deal to hear Jesus talk about that the, blood, the life of the world is my flesh, and unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. We know how to do that. That's sacramentally in the Lord's Supper. Because we have faith. God has given us that gift of faith. Now, Peter talks about believing in Jesus as the Son of the Holy One of God, but he also says, and we have come to know. You and I have come here to know that Jesus is the Holy One of God, for this is where we learn this. That's why we read God's Word in church, not only in the Scripture readings each week, but also in all the other things that we do, the hymnody, the liturgy, those are full of God's holy word that brings us to that knowledge that Jesus is the Holy One of God. So we come here in church to know Jesus, and we come here to further know Jesus. We want to grow in our faith. 
That's something that's in us. The Holy Spirit is prompting us continually. And he's using the events in our lives to draw us closer to him to show that he truly does love us. And so when we come to faith in baptism and our faith is strengthened, when we come to the Lord's Supper, we are now in a process of changing our lives to be like Jesus' life. Now, we all have plans for our lives, especially when we're younger. We have these dreams and these goals and these plans of what we would like our life to look like for a career, or for a family. And there's nothing wrong with all of these things. Hopefully, for the Christian, this plan that we have for our life, or the plans that we have for our lives, will be to live a life like Jesus, one of service, one of giving glory to God and loving our neighbor as ourselves. One of the things that we have to remember is that Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, is still true no matter what your plans are. The heart of man plans his way. That's the way God created us. We all have plans. But the Lord establishes his steps. God moves us in our plans and shows us the way. So when Jesus asks us, do you want to go away as well? We answer with Peter, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so those words, that gospel that Jesus was born and lived and died and rose and ascended are now in us, guiding us, showing us the way to live so that others may know about Jesus and that God will be glorified. And many of our plans then are embodied in our tradition. Many of our traditions in our life, especially as God directs our steps, establishes our steps, shape how we live out in this new way, the power of living with the words of eternal life. But traditions is next week's message, so you'll have to come back then to hear more about how traditions establishes our steps. The Lord uses to establish our steps. In Jesus' name, amen.